All right. Uh, the truth, nothing but the truth, uh, is what I'm here to talk about. Uh, and I'm uh, Hendrik Lindberg, um, work at Puppet. And if you don't know, I'm the person that you can blame for the Puppet 4 language, the Puppet type system, and now the uh, coming out just now in Puppet 4.9 uh, that broke everything <laughs> is uh, a new uh, version of Hira called Hira 5. And this is where you can find me and my blog and things like that. So this talk is a, uh, much more philosophical, I would say, than down at, in the command line uh, stuff. So, talk about truth. Do we know truth uh, when we see it? What is truth? So I'm going to start here. This is late 1800. Uh, this is an ad for Dr. Batty's uh, asthma cigarettes. Now, what's it, what is this all about? Is Dr. Batty here on a mission from God, or does he actually believe that uh, these cigarettes help with asthma, or does he believe that there are enough fools out there that will buy his asthma cigarettes to make him rich? Or was he maybe fooled by someone else? What's the truth here? Notice that it says it's not for children under six. So maybe he did, after all, conduct a scientific double-blind study that showed that the asthma cigarette has as little effect on children under five as would sitting next to a chicken. We don't really know. What's the truth here? The truth is that these asthma cigarettes, they did not contain any nicotine. They contained a drug called atropine. And atropine, if you happen to know that, is in large quantities a deadly drug. But in small doses, it actually had a positive effect on asthma because it treated the symptoms. So these cigarettes worked, but at the same time as you inhaled the atropine, you did inhale uh, particles that at the same time were bad because inhaling smoke is basically bad for anyone with asthma. This idea of inhaling, by the way, in, in, inhaling uh, something like smoke when you have a problem with the lung is an ancient belief, a folklore, that the problems with your lung is that there's dampness in the lung and therefore hot smoke would clear out the dampness and would th therefore be beneficial to you. So, Dr. Batty wasn't completely Batty. I really like his name, by the way. So goes with the whole idea. It's, you know, it's hard to know what the truth is when you see something. So what kinds of truths are there really? Um, ultimately, or we have the divine truth. It's written in scripture. Something is a mystery and we want to know what is the truth. We can go to scripture because in scripture we have the truth. Because God said so and the will of God is written down. And we can read in um, the book of, uh, book of Kings that uh, do not jeer at a bald man or you will be torn away, torn to pieces by bears. And of course it's written in scripture so of course it's true. There's a principle here that's called the coherence of belief. And coherence of belief means that what we believe to be true is what fits with what we already believe. And the less something fits with when we hear something new that is proposed as a fact, um, be it a real fact or an alternative fact, the better it fits with what we already believe, no matter what, how we form those beliefs, if they were formed on scientific facts or uh, folklore or divine truths, um, the more they fit, the more we believe that to also be true. And the other side of that is we also refute arguments because it doesn't fit with our belief system at all. So in a sense, that sort of defines what is true to each individual. Kind of, then on, on the right hand of the slide, you have um, what is more um, 
perhaps more true <laughs> in, in the real sense. We have the logical truth here uh, illustrated by uh, the Greek philosopher Aristoteles. Although we think of him as the father of, of, of logic, he, it's actually based on a long tradition from India and, and China. And this kind of logic is, says nothing about the, the actual facts of reality. Um, it's pure logic in the sense that, uh, and the core uh, thesis here is that no one can believe that the same thing can, at the same time, be and not be. Because something cannot both exist and not exist. That it's, it has to be one or the other. So this is the thing that Boolean, Boolean logic is uh, founded on. True or false? And of course, science. Um, well, science, in, in a way, doesn't really define an exact truth or falsehood. It's based on independently repeatable observations of reality. And then the beliefs that are formed from that are challenged. So you can say that scientific truth, uh, that is a statement of probability proportional to the evidence. It will change over time as evidence changes. Right. So, what truth is has engaged philosophers as long as we uh, as we know. Is there an absolute truth? Can this be um, proven philosophically? Can it be proven mathematically? Is truth actually a matter of provability? In post-modernistic thinking, the thesis is that reality cannot be known. It's only our beliefs about reality that can be known. And this is stated by um, the philosopher Immanuel Kant in his Critique of Reason. And I paraphrased what he's saying into our knowledge of a table, such as this table here, is just as opaque from reality, as is love. It is in our brain, it's a concept, but we don't understand it. Because it's all sensory input into our brain and it's what we believe about it that is the only thing we can know as being real. Now, this last bit, we don't understand it. That's, that's very interesting. What is that mystery? Before we continue on the path of truth, there's, of course, also distortions of truth. Because two half-truths doesn't make something true. So let's look at some things that just aren't true. We have pseudoscience. Science applied to non-science, or just pure nonsense, like astrology, alchemy, medical quackery, and the occult. Here's another great invention uh, um, from, from a Dr. Scott who in 1882 claimed that his electric flesh brush, which wasn't electric at all, it was magnetic, um, could cure rheumatism, diseases of the blood, malaria, and a dozen other serious conditions, and last but not least, least fix your toothache. Um, he got patent, uh, this patented in the US, and he sold lots and lots of these devices. He was very successful. Clearly, in life, and in particular in configuration management, we don't want to deal with bad science like this. Another source of what's not true is ambiguity. It's the lack of definition, the clashing of definitions. It's a great source of puns, so don't make me explain the very funny pun here. but. Um, our set of axioms are simply not well constructed, or it has holes in it. That creates uh, problems. And clearly, we don't want to work with something that is poorly defined. The real problem with defining the truth is the problem of paradoxes. Because if we are given a powerful set of axioms, be it in math or in human language, we can create an endless series of true but unprovable formulas like these. 
I really like some of these, like the first one. It's been my favorite for a very long time. Well, sorry, the second one. <laughs> the second one, I really like that. Uh, the first one is Epimenides' paradox, which is essentially this sentence is false. And that and all of these sentences, when you look at them, at first they appear, yeah, that's true. And then you go, no, it's not, it's false. And as soon as you take that position, it flips back again. So it kind of flips back and forth in your mind until you reach that point when you say, aha, this is a paradox. And what happened at that precise moment is that you are taking a step back. You're moving yourself out of that strange loop that this uh, paradox creates. And you raise yourself to another level where you, where you declare that this is a paradox. And this is something that the mathematician Gödel showed, that a system, it cannot prove the, tr prove the truth or falsehood of every formula within itself. So we need this escape to uh, another level. And of course, then as we escape to that other level, we'd repeat this problem. So it, it is like pointing a video camera at the screen and in order to, for it to describe itself. It's, it's this infinite um, recursion that occurs. Is this what Immanuel Kant was talking about? when we're trying to observe our own brain, our own thinking. We cannot think outside our box, uh, outside the box, because we cannot focus it on, on itself and then make, um, and we thereby create an understanding of it. So what is at the end of that recursion, if we were to have a high enough resolution in our video camera and our monitors? Would that be God that is looking back at us, or would it be quantum mechanics? I think we should all get some really good pot and figure this one out one, once and for all. All right. So what, what does it mean to escape at, an, at a higher level? I gave you an example of a paradox. It says, um, and this works when you're reading it. If you say this out loud, the, the first sentence up here would read, this sentenc contains three errors. We have no definition of what the sentenc is or what an error is, but our mind interprets that as sentenc meaning sentence and error meaning error, but they are misspelled. So we filled in that gap. But if we were to de define them and say that the sentenc is a kind of English sentence where the words three means four and error is a white space, all the other words are English, then we escape this and we defined it and it was and would read uh, this sentence contains four which it does so that would be correct as you noted so far my examples are expressed in english words uh, because that's we, how we communicate with words in a language so a language uh, is based on a shared understanding of syntax and semantics. It's built out of words, and words are symbol. We write them down as letters, or we use uh, pictograms, like in some languages. And symbols, they are abstractions. Sometimes they kind of mimic the word, but sometimes they don't. I don't know if you can read Japanese. Um, if you, if you can, then you understand this completely, uh, this symbol. But if I, if I tell you that it's pronounced I, then you would have to speak Japanese to understand what it means. It's still just, probably to most of you, uh, this is just a symbol. It's completely opaque to you. But if I tell you that it means uh, love, all of a sudden something happened in your mind when you understand this. You got the word love. And now we understand this symbol very differently. Let's see, if you're awake, um, I have an experiment here. I want you to, I'm gonna show you the next slide and I just want you to shout out as loudly as you can, uh, see if you're awake, what you see on that image. Are you ready? All right, three, two, one. All right, someone, someone is very bright, yes. Cow, God, good audience. Uh, 
Actually, it is a plush, uh, a plush puppet. It looks like a cow, so it's an abstraction of a cow. It's an abstraction of a cow, just as the word cow is an abstraction of cow. So cow is a kind of pattern that we apply. And when you saw that image up there on the screen, your, your brain um, applied all the pattern matching tricks it can do to that image, and you came up with, with cow. And someone has seen this talk before and, and knows it's a plush animal, so it's a bonus point. So how do we... How do we do that? How did all our brains collectively be able, were, how were we able to do that? Well, we trained our brains um, because we've been looking at lots of images of cows, at least I have, in order to prepare this, prepare, <laughs> this presentation. But in real life, we see things over and over again, and these uh, different kinds of cows, all in an, we all, our neural networks register them and we, and we learn to, uh, so that our, our pattern can recognize a cow and say it's a cow. And it's fun uh, to watch small kids as they learn. For instance, my uh, first daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, she was little, the, a dog walked by, she pointed to it and says, you know, dog or, or doggy. And there was another dog and a doggy again and she was doing so good. And then all of a sudden, one day, a dog walks by and she points at that dog and she goes, meow. That was a day you were doing so well. You know, what, what happened? <laughs> and it's actually that trying the edge uh, uh, conditions. So is this, you know, are these animals the kind that say meow or uh, do they go uh, woof? Um, she's now well over her 20s and she's doing really uh, well in uh, biochemistry. Uh, so there was nothing to worry about there. All right, but we train, our, we train our neural networks with images like these, with, with uh, sensory input that uh, form our opinion about um, uh, what constitutes a word like cow. So these, these words that we use, these symbols, they have a glow um, and um, this, um, this glow is bigger, I would say, the more abstract something is. Like the word love, it has huge connotations and lots of connections in our, in our minds. Whereas um, something far more precise, there are far more precise words for something exactly technical that doesn't have that much of a glow around it. You may wonder, what does love have to, get, have to do with it? Um, the point is that human language, it's filled with ambiguities, glowing words, paradoxes. And sometimes the meaning we're trying to communicate requires a lot of words. And sometimes there is this single well-defined word that is precise. Or sometimes we, we just misunderstand. And if we translate this to uh, configuration management. We don't want our servers to be pondering over paradoxes. And little do we care if they appreciate art. We just want them to do exactly what we told them to do without all these ambiguities and uh, problems. But that doesn't mean we're not passionate about it. So what we want to know is basically, is my CM logic error free? Does it do what I intended? I mean, we can easily run our uh, CM's uh, logic and see what happens, just observe it. But we don't want mistakes in our logic to turn our fields of, field of servers into uh, useless pumpkins. Um, we don't want to find in testing what we, we could have found when we author the logic. And when we author something for others, we clearly want to communicate to others how they should be using uh, what we have produced for them to use, like some module or recipe or whatever it's called, um, so that they can safely use it and, and taking out the guesswork. We humans can communicate with this fussy kind of logic um, 
the, the glowing symbol concept. And to quote Mon Monty Python, it would be like trying to, if we tried to use human language, it would be going something like nudge, nudge, you know what I mean? Nudge, nudge to the servers, and they're supposed to understand what I'm talking about. That wouldn't just work in a CM system at all. So systems don't understand it, but also humans, our brain is uh, wetware. It is not simply not the best machine to assert if our instructions to the CM system software are correct. We need to uh, have a better way of doing that. So how do we deal with things like that in our systems? How do we deal with the, the problems of truth? Is, is my, my software correct or not? And that is up to then the implementers here, in this case of the, of the CM system, the, the language that does this. So we can constrain the space uh, to what matters, uh, and I will show you some examples of that. Or we can cheat, we can short uh, circuit or error where it doesn't matter. Basic, basically, if you take that strange loop um, that you saw the video, the, uh, the video is filming the monitor, I mean, if we make that uh, video have very poor resolution, you won't be able to see what's going on after like one or two recursions. It just stops, so you can't see what happens. So we've hidden this um, um, regression, meta-regression, so to say, that, that occurs, because it is in every system in a way. Or we can just forget about it, cheat and say, you know, there's folklore. Uh, this is how you do things. Don't ever try to do these other things. Use these features this way because there are evil spirits out there in the forest and they will eat you and your children. Uh, so don't do that. It's horrible without offering any sort of explanation. It's just how you do things. Or the system could be, uh, could have more rigor, um, more protection. And, that, and then the case is, what is the right amount of rigor? Because if you're it's just like security. Uh, if, you, if you throw in too much security, people you know, try, you know, start to cheat um, and, and, and avoid it. And very pr practically, we found that in Puppet, the Puppet version 4 language, is, which adds a lot more rigor, uh, after people have tr had transitioned to version 4, they're very happy with the new uh, strict, uh, level of strictness that uh, it provides. And I have yet to hear someone complain over the strictness. In fact, everyone wants it to be even more strict. Um, so that's something we're going to be working on and adding. As I was looking for illustrations to what happens if you have a system that is not built on uh, strong principles, what happens? And I was looking for some pictures, like the, the, the old quirky uh, ones I like from, from um, last century, turn of the last century. I found a, a much more modern one, and, and it's a tweet from uh, Tag Gossip Girl. And Gossip Girl writes this about Microsoft Word. Move an image one millimeter to the left. All text and images shift. Four new pages are appear, and in the distance, sirens. Right. I mean, we have that in a lot of systems. It's not just like Microsoft Word that is doing funny things. Uh, Puppet, for sure, has ha had its share, and all systems have their share of like weird shit happening be because of bad principles uh, somewhere in the middle. And it's still going on. In um, I'm speaking about Puppet, there, there's a lot more to fix. And here's an illustration of that. This is DevOps engineer Jim using dynamic scoping and some resource overrides based on automatic tagging. All right. So when we have systems that have these paradoxes and endless recursions and, and whatnot, because they are there at the edges in, in a language implementation, how do we solve that? Well, there's a concept called Deus Ex Machina. Um, and this relates to the escape to another level that we were, I was talking about earlier. This was used by the old Greeks. And Deus ex machina means God's, God arrives via machinery. 
And they had this machine, it looked like this, and they hauled a god onto stage. And this was used during plays. And when they couldn't like, end the play or, or the plot in, in a logical way, they just um, hoisted the a god onto stage and the god set everything right. Uh, zapped the mortals, uh, killed them, or set, set the record straight. So all of a sudden, this just happens. Um, so god arriving by machine. Where does that happen in uh, a programming language in configuration management, and I'm illustrating that this with, with Puppet. So for instance, in Puppet we have the, the ability to declare a class, and a class can inherit another class. But you cannot inherit more than once, so you can't have a class C that inherits B that inherits A in turn. That is made into an error because it's one level only. So here God, in the form of the implementers of, of Puppet, decided one level is enough. The video camera cannot, you know, zoom. You cannot ha only have one, uh, one level of this thing. It's probably a good thing because the concept of inheritance here is flawed <laughs> uh, in, in, in other ways conceptually, that, we didn't, that the implementers choose to not make it worse by having multiple levels of, of inheritance. Something, doing something like this introduces a special case, which then permeates the logic in the system, make, makes it harder to deal with. Um, another way of dealing with such a problem of this kind is to just let, let it happen. Here, the deus ex machina occurs because you run out of resources. This shows that if you ask the number 42 what type it is, it will say that it is a type integer. If you ask that what type it is, it will say it is of type integer. And then it will continue to wrap if you were to continue to ask what the type of that was. All right. So th the practical use of this ends after like one or two of these iterations. But the implementation wise, we would just, we just let this happen because if, if anyone were to do this, it would basically be the same thing as pointing the video camera at the monitor. Yeah, you see an endless uh, thing and resolution here eventually runs, runs out because you will run out of memory or resor other resources. And that's fine. It is of no practical consequence that it does this because you would never do this. I'll skip that in favor of time. So, in Puppet, we added a type system because only deities writes perfect code. So what is a type, anyway? And I'm, oh, I'm going back in time, sorry. So type is a kind of pattern. It's an abstraction, just like words are an abstraction. There are, they are simply names for patterns that we apply towards objects that we are dealing with at runtime. It's just like the words cow or love. So here are some quick examples of puppet type system in work. So we have a, a, a bunch here of different values. So we can say that those are strings, those are numbers, those particular numbers are integers, those particular numbers are the integers five to seven, those particular strings are the, the, an enumeration, they are red, green, or blue, I can name them and say the type color is the enum red, green, and blue. And I can then use color as my type. Type system has powerful types like variant, which allows it to combine and say it's a color by the definition of color red, green, blue, or it's an integer, which could be an RGB value. So there's a whole bunch of these built-in data types that users can use in their manifests in Puppet 4. This was not uh, possible earlier. And instead you would have to do all your uh, type checking with imperative calls to function to say, is this an integer, is this a string, does it follow this pattern, etc. Now you can just declare variables and everything at, at the edges of the system and the system does this type checking on its own. So these types can be used in many different ways. 
if you're defining a function, a defined resource, a class, so forth, you could use the types of the type system or the types that you have declared yourselves. So, a type system or type theory. Um, really quickly because I'm coming up to uh, end of time here. I have a, a few more slides to go through. When you think about a type system, the, the, typically the first thing that you would counter is, is it a strongly typed or weakly typed system? But that is generally a, a fuzzy uh, concept. It, it could be translated to the amount of errors captured by a compiler versus how much is captured as runtime. You want as much as possible to be captured uh, at compile time or as early as po possible in the, in the, in the history um, in, throughout the workflow that you're using. Um, type systems started really as memory protection, um, against memory protection in, in, in assembler. Uh, you, you have no notion of uh, how, how big something is in memory, in storage. You could easily store 64 bits in a 32-bit slot and overwrite something that follows, um, which is a very bad thing, of course. Um, so languages like C were invented where type checking was uh, implemented. But of course it has a typecast that allows you to uh, say that something is of a different size. So there's really no, no um, complete protection. Then more modern languages where the objects themselves encapsulates all the rules, the, the memory protection aspect of, the, of type safety uh, is pretty much solved. Now we have operational safety to deal with instead. Can I, can I add can I, for instance, add these two things together, or can I say pop to this data element, or, or things like that? Can I, can I perform the operations on it? Is it safe, or will it blow up with an error and saying you can't do this with this kind of, of thing? So we want to be able to declare that. So the more powerful our type system is, uh, the more we can state what the uh, intentions are of our program. So, for instance, a union type is powerful. We have one of those in Puppet, it's called a variant. You can say it's a string or an integer. Or you can have intersection types, which we haven't implemented yet, but for instance, it must be um, between minus 128 and 127 plus, or it must be, uh, and it must be between 0 and 255. So that would create an intersection that says, well, actually those integers would be uh, between 0 and 127. There are other kinds of types like existential, existential, existential types, which basically means it has an interface which is very similar to duct typing, which we have in, in Ruby, where we just write code and expect it to you know, conform to the methods. Or uh, the, the concept of duct typing could be captured like Go does in that you declare an interface, and then something that uh, adheres to that interface would also mean that it is one of those types. There's something called dependent types, and the dependent types means that you're capturing aspects of a type at runtime, and then you can make statements about it. For instance, here, which we cannot do in, in a Puppet, is a function called shorten, and this is an illustration of what it might look like when and if we add that to the language. This would state that there's a uh, function called shorten that takes an array of some type t, so the elements are of that type, but we don't know what it is, but we assign it to a variable dollar $t, and then it is of some length dollar $n, which must be at least one. And then it returns an array, and that is what is on the right hand side there, it returns an array that has the same t as the one we got, but it is one element shorter. Now we defined an, a, the function for mutating an array, or, or actually creating a new array that comes back. So this is very powerful because if we know things like this, if this was stated on functions, uh, we would know statically uh, what this function does in more detail than if it was just called shorten, it takes an array of 
of some, some type. We don't know what it returns. But if we know these things, we can then make all sorts of assertions at the time of compilation rather than at runtime. So when we have a strong uh, type system, it's like having two programs in one, both the concrete level that we observe when we are running the program and another program that defines its meaning and that we can assert at compilation time. Just quickly, um, type inference, how does that work? Because if, you, if we can do type inference, that is, we can look at the program and then we can uh, infer what the resulting type is. Uh, it, at the core of it is basically what you see here on this slide. So if we have the expression 1 plus 1, we simply apply a function type to each of the uh, operands. Type of 1 plus, and we use the same operator, plus type of 1 which gives us the expression integer plus integer. Then we can evaluate that in our type system and integer plus integer will yield a new integer. This of course also works when we have indirection like $x equals 10 and 1 plus $x. It simply means that we de define that the type of $x is the type of 10 and we get to the same result that it's an integer plus integer which is correct. And the last example here is, well, if $x is a regular expression, then we would end up with the ex type expression integer plus regexp, and the, then the, the type system will know that, well, you can't add an integer and a regular expression. That's illegal, so this is an error. And then you statically found a type error in this program. So this is at the core of it. This gets more and more complex naturally because um, these types come from multiple directions. I'm going to skip this. Basically, uh, and concluding that historically, CM systems have been very relaxed about typing. Like in Puppet, it's all a string or it's just some, eh, some data type and if it's wrong later, it will just blow up. You will know later. So a type system matters very much to configuration management because it allows us to express the intended outcome of the configuration with more precision and higher quality. And it allows us to catch errors much earlier and at a much lower cost than if we simply were to observe everything blow up when we run our code. It also takes out hidden bombs bombs lurking in, our, in some branch of the logic that we are not currently testing or running in production, but eventually we might because some condition might be true and then we'll, you know, we'll be evaluating logic that we are not evaluating at the moment and then it will blow, blow up. So we make it more safe for the future. So advice, you know, especially if you're using Puppet, of course, and, and you can now start typing is to type all the inputs and the outputs, um, test a lot, and fail early. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much. Question, Question. yes. <laughs> Why would you say uh, that you don't want to overtype? Like, what did you mean by that in that last line? All right, very good question. Um, the people, for example, think so, the opposite. Right. So, the, the, what I meant was that you don't need to, to type the obvious um, if, if, because you allow um, inference to figure it out. Um, so, if, if if you are given two integers and then you're passing those two integers to off to some, some function or something or your lambda, you, you as a human as well as the computer can immediately see that they are integers. I don't have to check again that they are integers because it was just checked. I, irrespective of if it's you as a human or the system does it automatically. That, that's what I meant. 
Otherwise, type as much as possible, yes. All right, thank you.